Hi, my name is Bryn Boslett, and I am an infectious disease doctor at the University of California, San Francisco. Today, I will be discussing necrotizing soft tissue infections, of which necrotizing fasciitis is one. By the end of this session, you should be able to define the clinical features of necrotizing soft tissue infections, list the common microbial etiologies of necrotizing soft tissue infections, explain the specific pathogenesis of strep pyogenes necrotizing infection and features of the strep toxic shock syndrome, and describe the treatment of necrotizing infections. The word necrotizing is derived from the Greek word nekroon, which means to make dead. Necrotizing soft tissue infection generally refers to the death of subcutaneous tissue because of a rapidly progressing infection that spreads along tissue planes, causing destruction of fascia or muscle tissue and their associated vessels and nerves. Terms like flesh-eating bacteria have come from sensational news headlines that spring up whenever there is a particularly devastating case of this somewhat rare disease. There have been a number of other names given to necrotizing infections over the years, usually derived from a variety of classification schemes, which may be founded in the affected anatomy, depth of infection, or microbial cause. Awareness of this helps to reduce confusion slightly. Historically, necrotizing infections were classified according to specific anatomical sites affected. Fournier's gangrene involving the perineum, or Ludwig's angina involving submandibular and sublingual spaces, are two examples. These infections were named after the physicians who first described them. Alternatively, terms like necrotizing fasciitis or myonecrosis refer to classification by depth of infection and types of tissue involved. The term fasciitis very generally refers to inflammation of the connective tissue that surrounds muscles, vessels, and nerves. Myositis refers to inflammation of muscle and its associated structures. Myonecrosis occurs when inflammation leads to muscle cell death. When triggered by an infection, fasciitis, myositis, and myonecrosis all share similar causative agents, and the treatments are largely the same. Finally, type 1 versus type 2 necrotizing infections refers to classification based on the microbial cause, separating group A strep from other infectious agents. This terminology is generally used when talking about necrotizing fasciitis as opposed to muscular infections. Although these descriptive terms may be useful and are still used in the hospital and in the medical literature, they cause much confusion. One recently proposed recommendation suggested that the term necrotizing soft tissue infection should be used to describe them all, as the treatment is largely the same, early surgery and broad spectrum antibiotics. Necrotizing soft tissue infection is a rapidly progressive infection. It may begin from a pre-existing wound or skin defect, or it may occur after only a minor trauma with no apparent break in the skin. Risks are much the same as other skin and soft tissue infections, diabetes, neutropenia, steroid use, or any other condition that is associated with suppression of the immune system. Injection drug use, surgery, and burns are associated with more obvious portals of entry. Fresh or saltwater exposures may predispose to necrotizing infections from water-dwelling organisms. Peripheral vascular disease may influence risk due to lack of a robust blood supply to affected tissues. However, in many cases, there is no identifiable reason for the infection. The most commonly affected areas are the limbs and the perineal areas. Early in the course of the disease, Necrotizing soft tissue infection may look very much like cellulitis, but patients will often report severe pain in the affected area. For this reason, one classic description of early disease is pain out of proportion to exam. Nerve irritation is the likely cause of this severe pain. As infection progresses, the pain may lessen as the nerves die off. While thrombosis of capillary beds continue, skin may develop a black or bluish ecchymosis from underlying hemorrhage and tissue death, along with edema and bullae. 
In mixed or anaerobic infections, gas-producing organisms may lead to crepitus, which is crackling or popping sounds and sensations felt under the skin due to the presence of air in the subcutaneous tissues. Patients with necrotizing soft tissue infections often develop severe systemic toxicity, including fever and tachycardia, often progressing to septic shock requiring intensive care. Mortality rates have been reported between 25 and 75 percent, even with the appropriate care, but early recognition and aggressive therapy can increase chances of survival. The most common microbiologic cause of necrotizing disease is polymicrobial infection, meaning more than one causative organism. As mentioned previously, this is also referred to as type 1 necrotizing disease. A combination of aerobes and anaerobes from the gastrointestinal or genitourinary tract, or sometimes oral flora, may be found. This includes Clostridium, Bacteroides, Klebsiella, and other coliform species. Anaerobic metabolism produces carbon dioxide gas under the skin surface, which may lead to the finding of crepitus. A grayish, foul-smelling discharge, sometimes referred to as dishwater fluid, may be found if the tissue is opened. In non-perineal areas, the bacteriology of the infection typically reflects the surrounding skin flora, with aerobes predominating instead of anaerobes. Among the monomicrobial or single organism etiologies of necrotizing infection, strep pyogenes or group A strep is the most common. Again, this is referred to as type 2 necrotizing infection. Up to half of patients with strep necrotizing infection also develop strep toxic shock syndrome in association with their infection. Many of these patients have no evidence of preceding skin breakdown in association with their disease, but they may report a history of blunt trauma. A previously rare but now increasing cause of necrotizing soft tissue infection is Staph aureus, including community-acquired MRSA infection. Finally, in a patient with a severe soft tissue infection and a recent history of water exposure, Vibrio and Aramona species should be considered in your differential diagnosis. Necrotizing infection begins in much the same way as every other skin and soft tissue infection, with a capable organism meeting a susceptible host. As we already know, patients with diabetes, vascular disease, immunocompromise, recent trauma or surgery, or ongoing injection drug use are all susceptible to soft tissue infections because these conditions are associated with a breach in the skin surface and or a reduced ability to fight off infection. Let's focus on just one of our causative organisms, group A strep or strep pyogenes infection. Within 24 to 48 hours after infection begins, bacteria are rapidly dividing and releasing bacterial toxins locally into the surrounding tissues. Recall some of group A strep's virulence factors. Hyaluronidase, produced by the bacteria, helps to break down tissue barriers so that strep can rapidly spread along tissue planes. Streptolysin, which is the toxin responsible for strep's beta hemolytic properties on a blood auger plate, contributes to thrombosis within the surrounding vessels. Once the vessels are occluded, ischemia, meaning lack of oxygen, to nearby tissues and nerves, leads to nerve irritation and pain, although later the pain may turn to numbness. Strep pyogenic exotoxin is a super antigen commonly isolated from streptococcal strains that cause severe disease. Super antigens are proteins that are able to simultaneously bind to T cell receptors and major histocompatibility complex class C molecules. Such binding activates T cells, ultimately leading to a massive release of cytokines by lymphocytes and monocytes. While normal antigens stimulate approximately 0.001% of T cells, a superantigen may stimulate nearly 20% of all T cells. TNF alpha and other cytokines lead to increased capillary permeability and recruitment of additional inflammatory cells to the affected area. Clinically, the patient may exhibit fever, 
elevated white blood cell count, and tachycardia. The affected area may initially show nonspecific abnormalities, such as warmth, edema, and erythema. Later, as vessel thrombosis leads to ongoing ischemia, the skin, muscle, fascia, and nerve tissues start to die. This catastrophic buildup of cytokines can lead to acute strep toxic shock syndrome. Specifically, strep toxic shock syndrome is characterized by low blood pressure and evidence of end organ dysfunction, such as kidney or liver impairment, coagulopathy, or even acute respiratory distress syndrome. Strep toxic shock syndrome does not occur in every case of necrotizing infection, but when it does, a rapidly progressive clinical course is characteristic. With or without toxic shock, the case fatality rate of necrotizing infection may exceed 50%, even when the infection is recognized and treated appropriately. Like many other skin and soft tissue infections, necrotizing infections are diagnosed based on clinical features of history and exam. If there is any suspicion for a necrotizing infection, early surgical consult is advised to aid in the assessment. If the patient is well appearing and the diagnosis is otherwise unclear, imaging may be useful to provide additional data. This may show evidence of infection or gas in the deep subcutaneous tissue and fascia, but it can also be falsely negative if performed too early in the course of infection. If suspicion for necrotizing infection is moderate to high, treatment should never be delayed while waiting for an imaging study. Blood culture should be performed in all clinically ill patients with a soft tissue infection and may be positive in up to 50% of cases of necrotizing infection, but results do take some time to return. Surgical exploration of the affected tissue in the operating room may be necessary to confirm or exclude necrotizing infection based on intraoperative appearance and tissue pathology. In this lower image, which is an h &E stain, Necrosis of the dense connective tissue fascia is shown in the center of the image, interposed between fat lobules. The most important component of therapy for necrotizing soft tissue infection is surgical debridement. Early surgical intervention is also critical for removing the bacteria that antibiotics might not otherwise reach due to a devitalized blood supply. Antibiotics do play an important supportive role in reducing bacteria burden, and in the case of group A strep, may also inhibit toxin formation. There is not one single antibiotic regimen that would be appropriate, but the empiric regimen chosen should target the common causes of necrotizing infection. Let's go through those now. Mixed infections with anaerobic and aerobic organisms may be treated with a beta-lactam plus beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, such as piperacillin tazobactam. A carbapenem, such as imipenem or miropenem, would also be effective for suspected mixed bacterial infections in a critically ill patient. Staph aureus, including MRSA, should be considered, and vancomycin is the first-line drug for the treatment of MRSA soft tissue infections. Any and all of these antibiotic choices could cover the possibility of group A strep infection. However, clindamycin should also be added for its effect on inhibiting toxins produced by group A strep infection. We'll discuss a little bit more about that in a moment. An additional word about streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. This syndrome is distinct from staph toxic shock syndrome, which is a toxic shock associated with tampon use, amongst other things. Strep toxic shock syndrome may occur with strep infection at any site, but most often occurs in association with infection of a cutaneous lesion, particularly a necrotizing soft tissue infection. As already mentioned, strep toxic shock syndrome is characterized by low blood pressure and evidence of end organ dysfunction. Many patients also exhibit a diffuse erythematous rash. Recall that one of the manifestations of strep pyogenic exotoxin is scarlet fever but this is actually a less common feature of strep toxic shock in comparison to staph toxic shock syndrome. Blood cultures are very often positive for group A strep in this syndrome, which is another feature that distinguishes it from staph toxic shock, which rarely has positive blood cultures. 
The treatment of, te- of strep toxic shock syndrome includes supportive care, often in the ICU, and treatment of the underlying cause. I want to briefly touch on the role of clindamycin in severe toxin-producing infections, such as group A strep necrotizing infection. One benefit of clindamycin is the fact that clindamycin is a bacterial protein synthesis inhibitor. As such, it has a potent effect on reducing toxin synthesis by bacteria such as staph or strep. Clindamycin is less useful for severe infections caused by bacteria that do not produce toxins. A second reason for clindamycin use is called the Eagle Effect, named after Harry Eagle who first described it. This refers to the relative lack of efficacy of beta-lactam antibacterial drugs on infections that have a large number of bacteria. In such infections, the bacteria will often enter a stationary phase of growth and downregulate their production of penicillin binding protein, thus reducing the targets of the penicillin. Because clindamycin has a different mechanism of action, it is not affected by penicillin binding protein downregulation. Thank you so much for your time and attention.